Play ball. How you doing, baseball fans? And welcome to our final preview of the Brushback with J.P. Ricciardi. Uh, before we begin the regular season, let's bring on immediately Mr. J.P. Ricciardi, a 43-year baseball lifer, one of the best in the business. J.P., how you doing today? I'm good, John. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, lots of activity. Was in Florida for a bit. Uh, you know, uh, caught a little bit of a cold there, I guess you could say. Uh, but I'm feeling better now and uh, just excited for the final uh, few days before the regular season starts. Lots going on in baseball, and I know uh, we uh, you've got on a very special guest today, which we'll get to. But as we uh, head into the beginning of the season, JP, some really uh, interesting developments happening in the game. Let's start off with uh, uh, Yamamoto, the new free agent signing for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He did not, uh, well, he made an auspicious debut over in Korea. <laughs> you're, being, you're being very kind. Um, I am. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody should panic. He's going to be very good. I think he just had a bad day. You know, um, I, I if he was five starts into this, I would sit there and say, oh boy, something's not right. But there was nothing wrong with his stuff. He just had bad results. And, uh, you know, if you look across the box scores, um, of some, even if you look at the first two games, you know, some of the starters didn't have the outings that you would say, wow, that was a great outing, but I'm not going to put a lot of stock in one game. And I have a lot of faith in his stuff. I watched a lot of video of that guy last year, uh, scouting him while I was with the Giants. His stuff is too good to, uh, to think that there's going to be uh, big problems with him. So I, I wouldn't panic yet. You have five runs to the first inning. Uh, he only pitched that one inning. Like you said, it's, uh, Season hasn't started yet. He's got all the tools necessary. Everybody was after him. He got the big contract. So uh, once uh, they lift that gate up and those horses get out of the gate, uh, then we'll really see what Yamamoto is all about. Another big development, uh, the New York Mets. They went out and got J.D. Martinez, one-year deal, $12.5 million, $4.5 million being paid this year, the rest being deferred. Uh, what's your take on the Mets uh, bringing in this slugger to protect Pete Alonso and put a little bit more thump in that lineup? I like the move. Uh, I, I've always been under the mindset uh, anytime I was involved with the negotiating contracts, if I could get a guy on a one-year deal, there's no downside to that. Uh, if he has a bad year, everybody walks away. If he has a good year, then it was a good deal. So I don't think there's, there's much in the sense of saying, oh, we, we're committed to this guy for a long time. He's been a very productive hitter. He still commands the strike zone really well. He's going to give them coverage for Alonzo. Um, he's been very, very consistent over the last you know bunch of years. And uh, um, I was really shocked that he was still sitting out there because on a one-year deal, this is a guy who's appealing to a lot of clubs. Uh, and I just think maybe with the Mets situation, they probably could uh, promise him the amount of at bats that he's looking for. So I thought it was a great deal by by the Mets. Yeah, he had turned down an uh, offer from the Giants. The Angels were in it uh, at the end there. Uh, the Blue Jays uh, had been rumored to uh, be uh, having some interest in him, but of course they went to Justin Turner route. Uh, what do you think the you think the Blue Jays made a better move by bringing Turner in rather than signing JD? I do because I think Turner, for what the Jays have, um, I think he can give them a little bit more in the sense of being able to play in the field. Uh, you know, they lost Chapman. So, you know, JT, he can play third base. Uh, he can play second base. He could definitely play first base. Uh, I think his days of, on a pinch playing shortstop are over. But, um, you know, with Bichette, you're not going to have to have – He's going to play 156 games, so obviously barring injury. So I mm -hmm. think if you got 50 games third base from Turner, you get another 25, and at second you get another 15 at first, um, and then the rest of it is DH. I think his flexibility plays better for the Jays, where uh, JD would be strictly a DH. Yeah, well, it's uh, all going to happen really soon. I mean, we're getting really excited for the beginning of the season and what's upcoming uh, here at this program, uh, the brushback with J.P. Ricciardi. 
Uh, you uh, had a conversation. Uh, we're going to bring on Buster only. Buster is somebody you've known for a very long time, a reporter for ESPN's uh, Sunday Night Baseball telecast. He's also host of a very popular show, The Baseball Tonight with Buster Only podcast. Uh, why don't we uh, bring on Buster? You guys can take it away because uh, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating conversation about baseball and what's happening right now in 2024. You know, every good lineup needs a leadoff hitter, uh, a good leadoff hitter. And uh, our first guest on the show is someone that I think is the best in baseball as far as covering the game. Uh, I've known him a long time. He has covered the Orioles, the Padres, the Yankees. Uh, Obviously, people know him from ESPN now. Uh, as a writer and a analyst, commentator, uh, he breaks news all the time, all over the place. And my humble opinion, a future member of the Hall of Fame. Let's welcome Buster Only. Hey, JP. Well, Buster, how a, you doing? It was a heck of an introduction. You know, when you're talking about 43 years, I was thinking I've, I've known you for about 30 of those years. I was trying to think back, and I think the first time we talked was you were doing an article on Mike Bordick yep. uh, back in his Oriole days. But, you know, uh, first of all, Buster, I can't thank you enough for, for doing this. Uh, I know your time is, is real precious. You, you just got home from Florida, so you really don't want to be on a podcast with me. So I appreciate you taking the time. But, you know, just uh, just curious, before we get into all the baseball stuff, people see you on TV, people read your stuff. You know, why don't you share a little bit with the people that they don't know? When when did you fall in love with baseball? When I was eight years old, uh, my mom got me a book uh, about Sandy Koufax. And I grew up in central Vermont uh, on a dairy farm. And uh, my mom, you know, she knew that I loved numbers when I was a kid. And so she got me this book on, on uh, Sandy Koufax. And I just fell in love with baseball right away. I got my first two packs of baseball cards in that same year in 1972. And after that, I was just crazy about it. And we didn't have a television on the farm. And I listened to games on radio. I was a big fan of the Dodgers because of the Koufax book. And so when they would come east, you know, I would listen to where they were playing. KDK out of Pittsburgh, WCAU out of Philadelphia. You know, they go to Montreal. I listen to the French broadcast. Not that I even understand French, but I got to actually follow the Dodgers. And of course, you know, day by day by day, I wasn't a Red Sox fan, but I got to listen to Ned Martin and Jim Woods on Red Sox broadcasts on radio. And, and uh, yeah, I'm the ugly duckling of my family. The rest of my, my siblings, you know, both my parents, they couldn't stand baseball. But, uh, you know, I just loved it. That's crazy. Jim, Jim, Mar- uh, Ned Martin and Jim Woods, they used to call Jim Woods the Golden Pipes. He was like the voice of God. He had that deep voice. That's so I I met, you know, I, people ask me all the time, as I'm sure they do you, like, who's the, the person you were excited to meet the most? And I, you know, I covered Tony Gwynn, covered Cal Ripken, covered Derek Jeter. And I would always tell them the most excited I ever was was meeting Ned Martin. Like in spring training, 1989, to the day, and I was so enthusiastic that I'm sure that someplace down in Florida, near Plant City, there's a restraining order out on me, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I was, Mr. Martin, you're the greatest, and I just love listening to you, because that's, you know, those were the the first people that I yeah. talked to that really helped me understand baseball. And him and Harrelson were great together. I, I really enjoyed Ken Harrelson when he was with the Red Sox. I was sad when, when they let him go, because he, he just brought a whole different viewpoint to the game and they really bounced off each other great uh, that's did you ever go up to Montreal and watch the Dodgers I did actually my first major league game uh that I went to in the regular season I went to an exhibition game in Sarasota Florida when I was eight White Sox and Phillies but my little league traveled to Montreal for a late season game uh between the Phillies and the Expos and Ken Singleton had a grand slam home run in that game uh, you know, and I years later when I was covering the Yankees, I got to ask Singy about that. And the funny thing was, you know, I was just an idiot kid. And I don't know. And I, I went there because I was such a huge Dodger fan. I wanted to get Willie Davis's autograph. But I don't you know, I'd never gone to a game. I don't know how to yeah. get autographs. But I brought a baseball with me all intent on getting Willie Davis's autograph. I was too shy. I didn't ask before the game, which is when you get autographs. 
And in the middle of the game, I ran down to the edge of the Expos <laughs> dugout. He had been traded over to the Expos from Mike Marshall, the winner before. And, and Willie Davis is coming off the field. And I met him. I said, Mr. Davis, can you sign my ball? Reached up. Boom. Autograph. Like, you know, and I, I was like, man, I am golden Yeah, you, you uh, to broke, get his you, autograph. You, you broke a lot of rules on autograph. I broke a lot of rules there, and I didn't know for years. That's funny. Uh, so what year was that? That would have been 1974. You so know, it's fun to go back and look at the box scores, the games you went to as a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw a Red Sox doubleheader in, I think, 76. The first score of the first game was 15 to 11. The Brewers and the Red Sox had 11 home runs in one wow. game. Wow. Uh, you know, and I can, it's so cool to go George Scott, Boomer Scott hit a grand slam home run and, uh, it, it, you know, going to the ballpark for me was like, it was like a religion and, and oh, yeah. Red Sox my parents were going to take me and they could score some runs in 74, 75, the Red Sox. Yep. So, um, oh, that's, that's, that's so funny about, uh, the autograph. Uh, so anyway, I know you've been, uh. I know you've been bouncing around in spring training and all different places. I uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things with you. Um, some of the team, like for me earlier, I had made a quick uh, quip about the Yankees. I thought the Yankees, if they stayed healthy, a major if, had a chance to make some noise, uh, if not win the division, be a playoff team. I thought with, with Cole, and I, I got to see Rondon being very good with us in uh, San Francisco and Stroman, I thought they had a really solid one, two, three. And obviously with the Yankees, you know, they got a little bit of mix of older guys and younger guys, but the older guys needed to stay healthy. I thought that they were one of the teams that, you know, we, we should keep an eye on. Yep. But now with Cole, I, I'm really concerned because I think Rondon is pitching well in spring training. He might be able to carry them a little bit for a month. But how concerned are you about the Yankees right now? I would say 10 out of 10 about Garrett Cole's injury. It's interesting, you know, because I'll ask around. You'll see the messaging from the Yankees. Basically, a lot of silence for a few days. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of that was because you've got a pitcher who has the right to restrict what information's put out there. He's got an opt-out clause at the end of this year. He's potentially got a lot of money riding on the line for this thing. So they come out and they say, well, you know, he needs some time off. He He's going to be out a couple of months. And so I asked people around the sport who, you know, they have not seen his medical information. I want to make that absolutely clear. But I said, hey, what do you what do you think about Gary Cole? Oh, he's getting Tommy John surgery. <laughs> like it because they've seen this record play before. You know, they've seen this movie before uh, and they they know how the trajectory of these things go. If you have an older pitcher who's at a ton of mileage, because Garrett has been a great pitcher and he's he's thrown a ton of innings. They're like. It's only a matter of time before he blows out. And and you know this part better than I do. I'm fascinated by the option situation, right? At the end of the year, he can opt out of the contract. Uh, and the Yankees can void that option by picking up a $36 million 10th year on the contract. Now, at the beginning of this spring, before he got hurt, I think everyone assumed, well, you know, he'll have a good year. He'll opt out. The Yankees will pick up the option. They'll all move along. Now it gets really, really complicated uh, because at some point, if you're Garrett Cole and you have that kind of money on the line, you know, in the in the opt out and with the option, uh, look, it might not behoove you to pitch. <laughs> right. And and I'm going to be curious to see how that's a factor as we get closer. And, and look, they built their team around Aaron Judge and Garrett Cole. Right. Uh, and they need him to perform. They need Aaron Judge to perform to stay on the field. Um, and the fact is, and you know this better than anybody, having you know been a general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, the bar is really high in the American League East. Right. So, I mean, just between us two cats, what? Why aren't they in on Montgomery? What? What? What stop is stopping the Yankees from being in on Montgomery? I'm scratching my head over that one. They had him in the past. He pitched well there. It's you know a lot of guys you got to be careful who you bring to New York. This guy's already tasted New York. Yeah, I, I, I'm really scratching my head as to why we're not hearing more rumblings about him going there. It's the luxury tax, you know, uh, and this is why they they went out on Blake Snell. It's interesting because they made Blake Snell an offer of 150 million dollars. He turned it down, so they pivoted. They signed Marcus Stroman, but they're now over the luxury tax threshold. So any player they sign, they're taxed at a rate of 110 percent. 
let's say that they were the team that signed Blake Snell at $31 million. He would have cost them in that first year about $63 million plus the draft pick compensation. And the Yankees were like, nope, too much. Another factor is, is that there's a sense within the Yankees organization that Jordan, all things being equal, might prefer to play in a place other than a big market. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know that that's the perception of the Yankees and some of the other teams. But I'm with you, especially with what happened with Snell and his contract and clearly took a lot less than what people expected. He's such a good pitcher who is coming off a career year. He's perfect for the St. Louis Cardinals. He's perfect for the Boston Red Sox. Fill in the blank. I mean, if I'm the Giants at this point, quite frankly, because they've already, as you know, they've already signed free agents. Draft pick compensation isn't an issue for them. You get a good player at, say, $16 to $18 million a year. I'm grabbing that guy. Why not? And, and, And there comes a point where you put all your chips in. You know, like you said, you mentioned you mentioned the Giants, right? right? If they were able to, I still look at them, and it's a one-two combination. Harrison's still a question mark. He's a young guy. He's not. He doesn't throw a lot of strikes. He's going to be good, but to to count on him to say, okay, he's our number three. We check off that box. So their three, four, and five is still up in the air. If you push those chips in now and you get Montgomery, it's a great ballpark to pitch in, and you've shored up your defense tremendously. I'm with you with the Giants stepping in on Montgomery, but I just keep scratching my head with the Yankees. I mean, which kind of leads into the the next question between you and me on this. Are you shocked that the Red Sox and the Yankees and some of the teams that used to be the big market teams are now so driven by the luxury tax and have almost gotten away from – hey, we're supposed to be good. Our our fans deserve this, what they pay. I'm just really perplexed that teams like the Red Sox and the Yankees and even the Giants, for that matter, have become not uber teams. It's almost like the Dodgers have taken over everybody and the Yankees to some degree and maybe the Mets. But everybody else has become like a mid-market team. Yeah, and the Yankees this year, uh, I think their payroll is going to be at about $320 million. So they're big spenders this year. But to your point, I think it was three years ago. My numbers might be off a little bit. Their payroll was right around $210 million. To put that into perspective, that's lower than it was in the early 2000s. Okay? Right. The, the Yankees were spending more in and I'm, you know, 2004 than they did in 2021. That's insane to me. I have the scars. From from those years, and I, I I can definitely relate to you because I remember the Yankees having a two hundred million dollar payroll. You know, when I was GM in Toronto, and the Red Sox were right behind, and it was almost like they were driving each other. Yeah, and it seems like now the pedal's been pulled off, and they don't push each other like they used to. No, and the Red Sox are completely perplexing to me. What they're doing makes no sense to me. Uh, and there has to be more information that we're not privy to. You know, there's been so much speculation, as you know, because you live in Massachusetts, uh, that the Fenway Sports Group is having some financial problems. So maybe they're taking some Red Sox money to deal with Liverpool, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know the specifics right. of that. But the idea that the Red Sox in this era would have a payroll well short of $200 million is crazy and kind of criminal. And look, I, I, I toyed with the idea last year about writing an article saying, you know, essentially a letter to John Henry. uh, And it was essentially, look, you are a Hall of Famer. You know, at some point he should be honored at Cooperstown because in his first 17 years as owner, they won four World Series. They ended the streak of 86 uh, years without winning a World Series. But if you're not willing to spend, if you don't have the same type of passion now that he's in his late 70s, early 80s, whatever it is, then sell the team. Let somebody else come in and be aggressive. Uh, and and because you know that there would be people out there who would love to take that opportunity to buy the Red Sox. If it's not as important to them now as it was in 2003, 2004, let somebody else do it. It doesn't make any sense they would be that low in payroll. You, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point. And, you know, Buster, who can afford these teams, though? When you start thinking about, like, the Boston Red Sox, if they go on sale, what do you think their value is? Wow. They, they, they've got to be $5 billion? 
Yeah, something in that range. Um, look, so I, who, who steps forward with? I mean, I just saw what the Orioles sold for, sold for, and I know what the Mets sold for. The Boston Red Sox are as one of the top two or three iconic franchises: Yankees, Red Sox, and Dodgers. So I know it's. I know there are some people that have billions and billions, but man, who? It's got to be almost a conglomerate that gets together to afford these teams now. Which is why I think that uh, part of the reason why Theo joined the Red Sox ownership group, because I think, he, you know, he potentially has positioned himself to if John Henry ever decides to sell, Theo's in a perfect position and he knows a lot of people, right? People with money. And maybe they put that together. And look, um, and I've had this described to me by owners through the years, Peter Angelos, who I got to know really well as owner of the Orioles, uh, talked about this. There are very few of these opportunities. And we right. saw with Steve Cohen. I, I was in the Mets camp uh, last year. I remember the first time he met with the media. He loves it. He loves being the owner of the Mets. He loves the attention. Uh, you know, he loves having friends at the ballpark. Um, there are going to be people like that who are going to look at the at the Boston Red Sox and say, I'm willing to pay that price. So you asked me about, you know, what would it sell for? It would be whatever someone is willing to pay for it. And I think it would be a yeah. ton. Yeah. I mean, but, but you, as you know, someone pointed at, out to me, John Henry has the Fenway Sports Group. If you sell the Red Sox, you really can't call it Fenway Sports Group anymore. <laughs> so let's stay in the American League East. I know you uh, you thought that the Blue Jays didn't do a lot in the offseason. Um, but I, I like the Blue Jays. I think if they can stay healthy – their one through five is as deep as anybody on, on the mound. And I, I believe Guerrero is going to bounce back. He's too, I compare him to Jason Tatum in Boston. You know, people forget Jason Tatum is only 25, 26 years old. He's been in the NBA for seven years. Vlad's been in the big leagues for a long time, and he's only like 24, 25. He hasn't even, like, hit his peak years. So I think he gets hammered a lot because, obviously, there's great expectations of him. But – He's too good a player not to really bounce back and have a big, big season. I, I think him and Bichette are a cornerstone, obviously, of the offense. But I think the Blue Jays have a chance of winning the American League East. I'm, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. You know, it's interesting because a lot of the uh, the projections, the Pakota projections, uh, you know, p- uh, folks like Sarah Langs, Paul and Bikitis at my podcast, I give them, you know, I, I ask them for win projections. And I'm getting a lot back in the 85 to 87 range. And I think that's because of the offensive numbers last year. They finished 14th out of 30 teams in runs scored. Really disappointing season from Vladdy Jr. An incredibly disappointing season from Dalton Varsho, uh, who was the big piece in the trade they made with the Diamondbacks. But I will tell you this. Yesterday, I had Dan Schulman, the, the Blue Jays announcer, on my podcast. And he talked about how great Dalton Varsho looks. Uh, and you know this. A guy joins a team in a trade, and it can be unnerving the first year. He puts a lot of pressure on himself. He looks great. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. looks great. George Springer had a down year last year. Looks great. Alejandro Kirk looks better. Um, their rotation is excellent. I think the the big question for me about the Blue Jays now is the, are these late spring injuries that are popping up at the back end of their bullpen. Their depth is going to be tested. Um, I, I'm kind of pegging them in the 89 range. I'm yeah. with you. I, I think they're going to be better than what people expect because, you know, as it turns out, maybe last year was the outlier for Vladdy Jr. Uh, versus, you know, looking at that as being a symptom of what's to come for him. So I'm going to shift on you to uh, a team that I think is going to sneak up on people this year. I think the pressure's off. I think the expectations are off. I think maybe they removed a few personalities that are going to allow this team to maybe just be themselves a little bit more. And I think with the trade that they were able to make, I think their rotation is not unbelievable, but very formidable. And I, I think they're going to be a very strong contender for a National League wildcard team. And that's the Padres. So I picked them to win the World Series last year, obviously with the dumbest pick that you're going to hear today, JP, <laughs> from last year. Uh, so I, I don't think I'm going to pick them to, uh, to go deep in the playoffs this year, but I agree with you. I don't know if you were up early watching this game from Korea, uh, you know, early on Wednesday morning, but to see the makeup of the team, it just has a different feel to it. There's more of a grinder feel to it. Uh, and look, I, 
you know, Juan Soto was the guy who got traded. So you're seeing stories and they're kind of dumping on him. I don't think it was all him. I don't no. think it was all Manny Machado. I think it's a lot more complicated than the way people like to make it. Um, but I just think that, you know, they got uh, at the after last season, which was so disappointing. Their owner, Peter Seidler, passes away. Uh, you know, A.J. Preller, their general manager, goes out, is told essentially to cut his payroll by $80 million. And he was very imaginative and he was very aggressive. He gets Michael King for his rotation. He, uh, you know, makes the trade for Dylan Cease. Uh, I, I, you know, they improved their defense with some of the, the things that they've done. I like them. And I think also, I think when you see Mike Schilt getting a second opportunity to manage, you know, the last few years he's been saying, boy, if I get another shot, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to do this differently, this differently. I agree with you. They had a nice look about him as we started. Yeah. And I, I think uh, that division has become a little stronger with the, the additions the Giants have made. I think one of the things that flies under the radar with the Giants is the fact that they've improved their defense. Yes. It wasn't a very good defensive club. Uh, you know, Crawford had an amazing career, uh, but he had definitely slowed down. I think uh, the signing of Ahmed, even if he hits a buck 90, is just going to help. I mean, obviously, Logan Webb is a heavy, heavy ground ball sinker guy. And then having Chapman on the left side of the infield is definitely going to, sh you know, shore up areas that they were really shaky in. Um, I think they're a little short on the mound. I don't think they have enough depth. But they have definitely made themselves better. And I'm curious. I haven't seen him outside of scouting him last year, but I haven't seen him in spring training. I'm curious what you're hearing or what you've seen or what your thoughts are on uh, the son of the wind, Kim. So it was interesting. When he signed, the feedback that I was getting from other teams was it's going to take him a couple of years to adjust. Uh, they thought that athletically, this is the evaluators of the team, they thought it, athletically that eventually he'll be a pretty good player but they think he's going to struggle at the outset. He's had a good spring. Yeah. Uh, he fits that ballpark. You know, maybe it doesn't really matter that in his first year, he doesn't max out as a hitter. Um, I agree with you. I think that if you play in that ballpark and you have that pitching staff, defense is paramount and, and they have absolutely stepped that up, you know, about them in general, they're so they're counting a lot on the possibility of getting help from Robbie Ray, Alex Cobb in the second half of the season, on those, uh, my feeling has always been, well, okay, we'll see if it actually happens. Yeah, I agree along with you. The way, along the way, you see teams have setbacks. Uh, you know, player, or players have setbacks coming back from injuries. But they have more depth. Uh, they do need Matt Chapman to hit. I, I believe that. You know, I don't want to get off topic here, but you, you've brought something up that I want to touch on with. You with. Our game has gotten so sophisticated. We have every type of guru out there that can teach body movements and strength training, and we're supposed to be cutting edge on everything. Why are there so many injuries in our game? It's, it's just incredible. On the pitching side, there's no doubt in my mind it's about the chase for velocity. It's about the chase for the maximum spin on a breaking ball. Uh, because you're talking about players who, you know, when they fell in love with baseball, when they were six, eight, 10 years old, they develop a certain physiology, right? And then when they're 21, 22, and they go to these pitching labs and they're taught, you know, how to strengthen their lower bodies and you use weighted balls, uh, and they're trying to throw harder in a way that their physiology doesn't support. You know, I heard Chris Bassett the other day who is someone who pitches very effectively with 90, 91. He basically said, some bodies aren't built to throw 97. Right. James Andrews said to me 20 years ago, uh, when we had a conversation about this, that uh, you can strengthen a lot of parts of your body. You can't strengthen ligaments and tendons. And they're breaking down constantly. And I, you know, a, a few years ago, uh, I had a, a union representative ask me, what's the biggest issue in the game? And he thought I was going to talk about revenue sharing or something. And I said, it's the, uh, the diminishment of starting pitchers in this game. This mentality that you have to have this parade of guys who are throwing 99 miles per hour, really have no idea how to pitch, spinning the breaking ball as hard as they possibly can. Of course, it's going to lead to injuries is, is the way I look at it. I know some players have had conversations with guys like Rich Hill and Zach Eflin who believe that the pitch clock contributed a little bit to it. I think it's about the chase for velocity. And it's 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 like a a drag race uh, car redlining. It blows up at some point when you're trying to throw that hard over and over and over again. 
I don't know if you uh, you heard about what the Nationals put up in their bullpen. Uh, it was basically a statement saying, I don't care about your 97, 98 mile an hour fastball for ball four. And it's, it's interesting because earlier we were talking about we've lost the Burleys of the world, you know. Bumgarner. Yes. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and, and Hendricks might be the last guy with touch and feel pitching in the big leagues right now. He can add and subtract. He can, you know, elevate on occasion. But we've, we've lost those touchy-feely guys that, you know, they got through innings in 10 pitches because they put the ball in play with, within two pitches. And, and now we're chasing so much velocity. And I'm, I'm also worried because these guys are – they're starting these minor league camps in January. And you've got minor league prospects throwing bullpens, and they're, and they're airing them out in January. So now you've taken a guy who's going to start throwing January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. The minor league season goes into September now. So if you're a minor league player, you're throwing nine months as much as a major league player is throwing nine months. That and, J- and JP, no and they're being no asked, to, and they're being asked to do max effort pitches on every delivery, right? They're being asked to do max effort on every pitch they throw. There's no yeah. up and down and change speed and save, you know, as we saw with uh, Pedro Martinez. We see, if you've seen it with Max Scherzer, with Justin Verlander, you get to two strikes and maybe you, you ramp up the velocity a little bit to beat the hitter at the top of the strike zone at, you know, your 96. But these, a lot of the pitchers now, it's go as hard as you can for as long as you can, and then we're going to take you out. And, you know, the attitude of organizations now going into the year is let's develop as many of these guys as we can. It's like the NFL with running backs. Right. And it's, I, I have been surprised at the inaction of the union to recognize this trend. Cause you know, and I know if you've got 40 relievers taking up a bulk of your innings, making close to minimum wage or a little over minimum wage, that's a great way to keep your payroll down as opposed to paying starting pitchers. But to this point, I have not seen the union prioritize this as an issue, trying to restore the preeminence of starting pitchers. So I have an interesting question for you. Uh, if this is the way we're going as a game, if we're going to be openers and one and two inning pitchers, what is the future of starting pitching in our game? How do we keep developing them? Because what's happening at the minor league level right now is they're not even developing starters. They're developing guys to throw one and two innings, yep. which leads me to another question. Spring training used to be six weeks, so you got the pitcher in shape. He'd go an inning, two innings, three, you know, build himself up. The last start would be seven innings. So on opening day, if he was really feeling good, he can go nine. Why does spring training have to be six six weeks now? I mean, we just got these guys and we're running them out there for an inning. That's a great question. I and and I hadn't thought of it in that context, but you're right. You're not you're not looking to develop these guys to throw uh, you know, 100, 120 pitches anymore. You're asking them to essentially throw 15 to 30 pitches at max effort each one. I I hate the trend line. And not only because of the injuries, not only because, you know, as someone who roots for the players, uh, I do think they're financially they're starting to be affected in free agency because teams are like, "You know what? We're not going to pay. I mean, Blake Snell, you know, this. he's known as a five inning guy. uh, And, and, you know, because he was a guy, max effort, five innings, get him out of there. Well, guess what? He hit free agency. And what's the biggest knock? He doesn't take you deep into games. We're not going to pay him. And as the average start goes down, you know, from six innings to now, it's about four and two thirds, four and a third innings. Teams are not going to pay those guys. But it's not only about that. Starting pitchers have to be the Hulk Hogan's. And the and the Andre the Giants of the sport, they have to be the people who inspire fans to to pick up the you know turn on the television to go buy tickets to go watch these guys pitch. Now, I'm sorry, but uh, you love the individual stories of these uh, short relievers who are making it to the big leagues after pitching independent ball. But guess what? No one's going to go and pace and see those guys. They're not going to be headliners that are going to engender the interest of casual fans. And baseball's got to fix that. That, to me, right now is the biggest problem that baseball has now that we've got the pitch clock in the game. I think you're going to go to the Smithsonian in a, in a few years, and they're going to have like a replica of Bob Gibson, and they're going to say, this is what a starting pitcher used to look like. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just – I don't understand how we've gotten away from it. And, I, you know, you, we were fortunate. In Toronto, we had Roy Halladay. 
And I knew every fifth day that guy was going to post. And I knew every fifth day that guy was going to pitch seven innings, come hell or high water. If he got, if he gave you, you know, if he got three innings in the first inning, that was all you were going to get. And Roy was going to shut it down. And I look back and I even remember, you know, telling him this, what a pleasure it was to be able to watch a guy every fifth day take the ball. It's the only time as a general manager that I actually went like this. I know Roy's <laughs> going to give me seven tonight. And But I look back, even in Toronto, we had Ted Lilly, Sean Markham, A.J. Burnett, and Roy Holiday. I knew those guys were going to – there wasn't a five-inning guy there. And then you play the Yankees, and it was, you know, uh, Pettit, and it was that – it was Clemens. It was – that crew, then Pedro and and all in and, and, you know Wakefield, uh, God rest his soul. And you you knew that these guys were gonna you're gonna have to face these guys four times through the lineup. And uh, I just think we've lost the entertainment value in our game. I think the people that are making the decisions forget that, like you said, when when a guy shows up, wow, Roy Halladay's pitching today. Wow, you know Dave Steve's pitching today. Roger Clemens pitching today. Imagine if you told Sandy Koufax he could pitch five innings and make $31 million. Crazy. <laughs> oh, man. And and to your point about being entertainment, you know, the best quote I've ever heard in that was uh, I was talking to your former boss, Sandy Alderson, uh, about Michael Jordan and flirtation with him back in what was it, 92, 93. And, and he, you know, as you know, the A's made him an offer. They wanted to bring him in. I said, Sandy, what would you have done with him? Where was he going to play for? He goes, who cares? It's Michael Jordan, yeah. you know, because he knew it would be entertaining and he knew right. people would want to watch. Look, uh, you, you know, how much, how excited did baseball fans g- get about Roger Clemens versus Pedro Martinez, about, uh, you know, Johan Santana in his prime going up against Roy Halladay? You know, that's lost. A lot of it, so much of it is about – the mindset of front office folks now in this youngest generation of control. They want to control everything. So they want to get pitchers who have a lot of swing and miss. Uh, I, I've actually thought that as Major League Baseball is, is making this effort to try to increase offense, why not uh, put some restriction on how many relievers you can use? Let's say four in a, in a game with obvious exceptions for injuries and for blowouts, four relievers in a game, to incentivize managers to keep starting pitchers in the game. I mean, Madison Bumgarner in the postseason in 2014 threw 52 and a third innings. Now we don't even know if a Madison Bumgarner can exist because to your point in the minor leagues, they're not even talking about that. And so that's why it jumped out last fall when Bruce Bochy won another World Series. He's very much of the mindset of, you know what, I'm not going to script it. I'm going to see what the pitcher's doing, and I'm and if the pitcher's throwing great, I'm going to leave him in there. Bradford's throwing in relief against the Orioles. You know, normally you'd look at him as, you know, a guy at an ERA like 5-7 the regular season. You probably, there'd be some teams that would script it, getting him out of there after three batters. Boach is watching him, and he's getting an out. He's getting another out. He's getting another out. He winds up leaving him in the game. He goes four and a third innings. How about that? But well, I, that's yeah. not the mindset of teams anymore. You, you have opened up a whole can of worms here that we could talk about forever. It's just the, the, the absolute control. Yes. I, I got to believe um, that Kevin Cash wakes up in a cold sweat at least once every winter having to have take out um, who was pitching so great. Blake was it, Snell. Blake Snell was pitching so great, and he took him out of the game. And I would love to put some truth serum into Dave Roberts and ask him, um, when uh, the left-hander for Rich Hill. yeah, Rich Hill was pitching so well and breezing through the lineup, and they took him out of the game. I mean, as a okay, let's let's put our fan hat on for one second. As a fan, don't you sit there and say, "What the hell are we doing? I don't get this. This guy's getting people out." Now you put your baseball back hat back on and you say, "Where have you lost the field?" Just like you said with Bochi. Hey, I want to get one inning out of him. Guess what? He, he breathes through that inning. I'm going to run him out for another one. You know, I, I know the numbers are telling me this, but this guy's showing me something different today. We've we've lost the field to have common sense and just let the game dictate what we should do. And it's because of the numbers. And you know this better than I do because you've actually worked in a front office. The you know the decisions are rooted in numbers uh, versus 
understanding the personality of players, seeing what you're seeing that day. Uh, you know, how does adrenaline affect a player? I think the moment that really jumped out to me uh, along those lines, and I'm going to get the year wrong, but it was late in David Freeze's career, and he was in a platoon role with the Dodgers, who, you know, at this time they were doing all the mixing and matching and pinch hitting in the third and fourth inning. And David Freeze starts the game, and I think it was the fourth inning, uh, the opposing team brought in a right-handed pitcher, and David Freeze was pinch hit for. In the World Series, I'm like, this is David Freeze. He's one of the greatest players in the history of October. His heart rate is here. Right. What are we doing? Uh, and, not to, and not to mention, you're burning your, your, you're burning your bench right away. Right. You've lost any type of potential matchup down the road because you just burnt. You've taken that bat out of the lineup. So I'm on the other dugout. I'm saying, check for me. I'm ahead of you right now. Now you're bringing in someone else. And the other thing that amazes me is when they do those double switches, they end up burning three players because they lose the hitter freeze. They bring a guy in, and sometimes he's not the defensive replacement they want. They bring a third guy in to play that position. So you've just burned three players in the fourth inning, and now your bench is shorter. So I'm the visiting, I'm the opposing team. I'm sitting there saying, well, I'm, I'm deep in your bench now. My matchups favor me. So uh, I don't know. We could talk about, uh, we could talk about that for, for a long time. Uh, but you've been, listen, you've been great with us real quick. Uh, what do you love about the game? What do you like about the game today? Well, first, I mean, as a reporter and it's something I've loved since I started covering it, I love to, to get the backstories and to hear the stories of, you know, how players, uh, you know, got to this place, their back. I mean, baseball is such a great fish hook bowl of humanity. And then you mix in competition and you, you know, you, you mix in, uh, um, the fact that people are from so many different uh, places, I, I just love those conversations. Um, and I always love to hear about player adjustments, you know, um, Trevor Hoffman, who I covered when he was traded to the San Diego Padres in 1993, uh, he, he injured his shoulder playing football on the beach. Oh. And the next spring he had lost like six, seven miles per hour off his fastball. And he was telling me this story like late in his career when the money didn't matter. Uh, and, 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 and I said, well, Trevor, what'd you do? And he told me about how, well, he had a teammate, Donnie Elliott, they'd gotten into Fred McGriff trade who showed him this, this, uh, grip where he pinched his change up with his index finger and his thumb on the seam of the ball. And he tried it in spring training. He hadn't told anybody that he had blown out. He was desperate to find something and the ball moved perfectly. And his, yeah. he and Brad Osmus are like, oh man, that's great. <laughs> and I, I love stories like that. I've seen the adjustments that players make. Changed his career. Made him a Hall of Famer. Yep. Same, same as Mariano Rivera. Right, with his cutter. That's exactly right. I, I you know, those, those uh, to have the conversations with players on a daily basis and learn what they're working on, you know, get a feel for what's driving them, you know, uh, the game this morning, you know, watching the, the Dodgers and knowing – how much pressure that team is going to be right. under. You know this right. better than I do. If they don't win the World Series, uh, you know, their season is going to be considered a failure. So how do the players deal with that pressure on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that, that's the best part about the game is really just spending time with the people that are in the game and, yep. and learning and, and just, you know, bouncing ideas off them, learning from them. Uh, you know, that's, that's one part of your job that I envy a little bit because I, I got to do it when I was with a team. You get to do it with all the teams. And, and you know, speaking of all the teams, I guess, um, who, who do you like in the American League? Who's your pick to come out of the American League? So I'd, in the end, my World Series pick uh, that I made was Phillies over Astros. Uh, I think the Astros, and this is the beginning of spring training, and I don't know if I would necessarily, excuse me, Phillies over the Yankees. And then I switched to the Astros, and now I'm worried about the Astros with their starting rotation. I think the difference between the two leagues right now is enormous and that the American League has a chance to have, uh, you know, a surprise team, sleeper, whatever you want to call it, come out. The Seattle Mariners, to me, are really interesting. Yeah, they're scary. Their rotation. And Jerry they're DePoto, scary. their general manager, super aggressive uh, in making moves. If they have holes at the trade deadline, he'll work to plug those. Um, I, you know, you mentioned the Blue Jays. Maybe they're the surprise team coming out of the American League. I, I look at the National League and they have three super teams. Braves, Dodgers, Phillies. Uh, in the American League, it's not nearly as top heavy. And maybe the you know the Rangers become the first team since the the Yankees of ninety eight to two thousand 
to go back to back because they got Jacob DeGrom, they got Max Scherzer coming back sometime in the second half. Yeah, it's going to be like them making a trade for him at the right. uh, the trading deadline. Well, Buster, we've taken up enough of your time, buddy. I really, really appreciate it. So we won't hold you to those predictions. What we'll do is we'll check in with you maybe oh, around no. the All Star break, and uh, and you can you can put some white out in and, and maybe <laughs> re, re, revamp. But can't thank you enough. You you are our leadoff hitter on the the brush back with JP. I can't thank you enough for that. And uh, good luck this year. Safe travels, and we'll be as always watching and listening. Anytime I get a chance to talk baseball with you, JP, it's so much fun. I appreciate it, Buster. Thanks. Be well. Great conversation. You two guys uh, talking to each other. I mean, it was like just getting such an education, getting that insight from this great insider. And, of course, your experience in the game. Uh, Great get with Buster, JP. Yeah, Buster's a – he's a class act all the way around. You could see his passion he has for the game. Besides the knowledge he has for the game and the, and the total recall he has, just amazing passion. And I think he's, he stated, you know, what he really likes about the game is is the people that he gets to know and, and finding out their stories and being able to present those stories. So we were very fortunate to have uh, Buster on the show, especially as our, our leadoff hitter. And uh, we'll get him back on again sometime in the middle of the year, be able to tell us, you know, what he's seeing shaping shaping up in the season and uh he's he's just uh, like i said earlier i've known him a long time but he is definitely uh when you're looking for coverage on baseball and want to know what's going on he's the guy to go to so we're very fortunate to have him oh absolutely and uh, our spring training is about over now uh, as we prepare for the debut with the very first uh, full episode of the brush back with jp Ricciardi. lots of great stuff upcoming for baseball fans uh we look forward to it. JP, I know you're working those phones as you did when you were in the GM seat talking about who's going to be coming on, what the topics are going to be. It's going to be great conversation all season long. And man, I can't wait to get started with you. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm excited. Every time the season comes around, you feel like a little kid again and everybody has great hopes. And uh, we're going to get some great guests on and be able to give us insight on things that you know most people hear about, but don't really get the peeling onion back. and and see what goes into not only the major leagues, but all the infrastructure for the minor leagues uh, through scouting, player development, and so many different facets. So I'm really excited, and I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. Uh, Don't forget to follow the show uh, on social media. You could go to at RicciardiJP. It's Twitter, uh, X, used to be Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Subscribe to the shows because you get those notifications when the shows drop each and every week. And uh, we're going to have a very exciting season for you. JP, can't wait to get started. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Let's uh, let's do it up. Let's talk baseball. Let's educate these fans and give them some insight. They're not going to get anywhere else. Play ball. Play ball.